Ladies and gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For over 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of art, politics, social justice, film, theater, and of course, music. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with two-time Academy, Grammy, and Golden Globe award-winning singer, songwriter, director, author, and visual artist, David Byrne. The co-founder of Talking Heads will discuss his upcoming show, American Utopia. Described as a once-in-a-lifetime Broadway event that marks a major cultural milestone in the worlds of music and theater. Moderating tonight's conversation is Rom Tannenbaum, frequent contributing writer for the New York Times and the co-author of the acclaimed 2011 book, I Want My MTV, A History of the Network's Origins and Influence. And before we welcome our esteemed guest to the stage, a quick word from our sponsor, City. Short and sweet, but to the point. Uh, please welcome me. Oh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Rob Tannenbaum and David Byrne. David Byrne, you have never done a Times Talk before. I have never done a Times Talk. Um, the timing did not work out. The timesing. <laughs> well, the timing this time works out because you have a Broadway show that's opening on October 4th. Yeah, it's good timing. And it's called October 4th, right? That, that tickets are on sale now. Not that we're trying to sell tickets or anything. Uh, it's called American Utopia, the show is. And uh, it comes out of the album that you released last year called American Utopia. I think in order to set the, the right um, context for this, it's important to say, w when you say utopia, you're not being facetious. I'm not being facetious. I'm not, I'm not saying that we live in a, a utopia. I'm certainly not saying that. Um, I'm saying that there's an, there's an idea in this country that, that things can be better, that we can make something completely new. Um, there's a quote from James Baldwin who says uh, that despite everything he lived through, he's, he said that he still believes that something can be done in this country that's never been done before. Mm. And I don't think he means what's happening now. Right. Well, it's interesting because I, I, I spoke to you uh, for the New York Times when the album had just come out. And we discussed the fact that it's difficult to think of the word utopia given our circumstances, our political circumstances. And I think that's only gotten deeper in the last year. Do you, you continue to feel essentially optimistic? Well, it depends on what morning and what, <laughs> what I read in the paper that day. Um, it's, it's, it's tough, but I feel like if I'm gonna keep my sanity, I have to try and maintain some kind of hope and optimism and a, a sense that we're better than this. You had a, a, a talk called Reasons to be Cheerful, which I think uh, you, you took the title from the great Ian Dury song, Reasons to be Cheerful, part uh -huh. three. Yeah. And you were talking about sort of micro events around the world, and, and especially in the United States, which gave you reasons for hope. Do you seek those things out? I do. If, uh, I mean, in my news reading, and I'm kind of an avid re news reader, I read a lot of newspapers and magazines and things like that, but if I see something, I go, 
looks, something was done in Sweden or something was done in Uruguay or whatever, and it worked. They did X and it was successful. Could it work somewhere else? If so, let's, let's, uh, let's tell everybody about it. Yeah. Well, the, the question is why bring a rock concert to the stage? And I think one of the things that, that people should know about the show you've been doing in concert venues and will be doing on Broadway is the staging is unique. Yeah, I think it, um, okay, should I, should I explain the yeah, staging to, to people who haven't seen the show or don't know anything about it? Um, I decided to, <laughs> I had done shows previously where some members of the band or the ensemble were untethered and could move around, whether it was horn players or myself or some others, some dancers or some singers or something like that. This time I decided, what, would it be possible to have everybody, uh, the, the band, the singers, drums, everything, all be untethered so they could all move around and, and play. Uh, so the drum would, drums would be like a drum line. You'd have however many drummers you needed to make the sound of a drum kit and drum percussion and all that. Uh, and the other instruments too, uh, even keyboards, um, it turns out can be un, uh, yeah. untethered. Uh, so I discovered that yes, it's possible. It's technically difficult and of course it's, it means more people so it's not cheap for me. Um, so I had to kind of do the math first, but it does work. But if, so what that means then once I discovered that that could be done, what that meant was that the stage can be completely empty. And I mean, yeah. I mean completely empty. No amps. No amps, no, no lights, yep. no things to go pff, or little risers or little stands for people or, little, or water bottles. Water bottles are forbidden. Yep. I, mean, uh, I mean, do you come to a show to see a water bottle? No, you come to see people. So I realized we're going to take away everything from the stage except the people. That's what we as humans are most interested in. Yep. Other people. We're not interested in water bottles or little risers or lights that go like this. We, we're interested in other human beings. And I thought, let's take away everything that isn't that and see what happens. And it works. Because that is what we're interested in. Right. One of the things that, that it makes me think about is that in a typical rock band or in how 50, 60 years of rock bands, there's a hierarchy of attention. The people who can't move, the drummer, the keyboard player, get the least attention. We focus on singers and guitar players because they're mobile. So this is kind of a democratization of a band. Certainly of attention. So sometimes, uh, yes. Sometimes the drummers go to the front and I go to the back. Yeah. Uh, and everybody gets to see what the drummer, how they do what they do. Um, and it's kind of exciting. Everybody gets a moment or two or three. Um, it's a very di diverse group in many different ways. Yeah. So uh, we, yeah, we sort of represent something. What do you represent? Um, that a group of people as diverse and with doing different functions and having different things to do that we can all work together mm -hmm. and produce something that, that works. When I saw the show, the drum kit had been broken down into six different percussion players. There are six percussion players in your ensemble. How does taking the drums out of one person's hand and putting them into six per people's hands change the music? <laughs> uh, I had other musicians see it and they, they sort of didn't believe that it was possible. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that how can they play together so it sounds like one, one person, one thing. Drummers just do that. They know how to do that. Good drummers can do that. I mean, look at New Orleans or samba schools in Rio or uh, different, uh, you know, other kind of drum lines and kind of footballs, things. They, when they're good, it sounds like one, one thing. <laughs> 
how do you audition a drummer who's only going to be holding a bass drum? <laughs> we do give, usually give them other things to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, they do get to swap out occasionally, but yeah, we've, at first, there's, sometimes there's a f maybe a feeling like, um, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah. This is what you want me to do? I said, you wait and see, you've got to move and do it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and there'll be times when you, you're, you'll be the center of attention. And that doesn't mean a drum solo. That means you might be doing movement or something else. So um, it turned out everybody was kind of happy with how the things were broken apart. Is every movement in the show choreographed? Um, no, there's a couple, there's a, <laughs> there's a few brief moments where we're kind of uh, left to our own devices. <laughs> that's, um, <laughs> that's, okay. I get, I get asked that, that question or something close to it yeah. now and then, um, or something to the effect of, is every show you do the same? Right. Um, if I go to see the show tomorrow, will it be the same show I saw tomorrow, the, the day before? Um, the answer is pretty much yes. If you go to see a play, do you want them to change the ending the night you go? Well, that would be a special case. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see a movie, do you want them to kind of, you know, improvise? There are directors who work with casts or improvising, but in most cases, you want them to say the lines that the writer wrote. Because that makes the, that's been worked out so that it tells the story and actually has the emotional effect on you, the audience, mm. that, that you want to have and that you pay to experience. Um, so I, um, I've been to shows where people are improvising and, and it can work it can work great and be a wonderful thing to watch something evolve and be created uh, in front of your eyes. But in this case, it's something that's been very worked out with an idea that to have the most the most engagement. And, and I imagine that's not a huge change for you because over the years, rock concerts have become much more strictly timed and formalized. The, the lights, the sound, they all have to react to cues. And bands nowadays are playing the same set every night in every city to make things easier for the, the crew. So it's not a huge change. It's not a huge change. Um, there's a, there's a, a bias against it, though. There's a feeling in that music world that if you are playing, if it's kind of a scripted show like that, mm -hmm that it's not authentic, that the feelings can't be real, um, that you're not really, that you, it's not your real feelings that are coming out, it's just a, you're just a puppet show. And uh, it can be a puppet show. We've all seen shows where it's choreographed and worked out to within an inch of its life and it kind of lies there dead. Um, and there's no, you don't feel anything. Yeah. But it doesn't have to, there's other times when, when it's really worked out that you feel more than you would if it was authentic. I have a problem with the word authentic, especially as it oh, pertains too. to popular entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, is anything really authentic? I mean, the, the example I think of is Creedence Clearwater Revival, which is considered one of the great, true, rootsy American rock bands. John Fogarty wrote songs about growing up in New Orleans. He sang them with a New Orleans accent. He's from the Bay Area. <laughs> so we, the, the search for authenticity really clouds this idea that people can present their ideas in any fashion they want to. It's, a, it's an idea that won't go away, though, or the idea of something being authentic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it has a, there's a real kind of a staying power to it. Where in your performing career did you start to get interested in, uh, I guess, what I'll call artifice? Um, it wasn't for a while. It was a, f a good few years in. Yeah. Um, I think it was probably 
one of our tours ended, one of the Talking Heads tours ended in, uh, I think, Japan. And so I decided, oh, I, this is a really interesting place. I've never been here before. I'm going to stay on and uh, take in the, the sights. So I went to see a lot of Japanese theater, which, of course, is very, very artificial. Um, you know, Bunwaku and No and Kabuki and uh, you go to a sumo wrestling and what it was all artifice. It's all got, uh, no, nothing. Nobody looks looks like that. Um, and I traveled around a little bit more, saw other kinds of theater in uh, East Asia, and it gradually dawned on me that um, that the that the world on st that goes on stage is very different than what hap what happens to us when we when we go home. That why should we pretend that that uh, <laughs> that yeah that, that we're not that our words are not kind of say we're doing a play or something and it's a kitchen set. It's um, I thought um, it can work, but I never believe that it's a, that I'm looking at someone's kitchen. Yeah, um, I know that it's all been written, and so you have that. Layer, there's even that kind of verbal layer of artifice. And then, of course, there's the other layer of it can be a very stylized, non-naturalistic kind of performance. And I thought, but, and that's what I do. That's what I, that's what I do as a musician. Um, maybe I can bring some of that into what we do as, a, as performers, because we're certainly not um, we're not sitting around a campfire and singing to people. Yeah. And I would imagine that moving closer into theater or film, as you also have, gives you more license to play with artifice. Yeah. Because people expect it. Yeah. Once you do it a little bit, then it becomes something like, oh, yes, I, I know the grammar of this a little bit. I sort of know how to do this a little bit. And I think it's also partly myth and expectations. You go to a movie, you understand those are actors on the screen. Whereas you go to a rock concert, you expect the authentic individual singing in the first person. And I think w with you in particular, the, the autobiographical fallacy is kind of dangerous. There are lots of songs where you are singing I, and it is not you. Yes, of course. Other people do that too. But it, it's just bound to lead to some confusion. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, and it's, like, it's like the, um, it's like, it's like, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> we should uh, give some credit to Annie B. Parson, uh, who you've collaborated with for a number of years. And uh, her credit, she is the choreographer of the show. I believe she has another credit. Something I'm not larger. sure exactly what it is, but yes. But, but she, staging and staging, choreography. Right. Uh, all like the that. movement is done by her, right? Yeah. And we've worked together a, a number of times. So we've, I think, become very comfortable as collaborators. Um, she can, say, do something where the, all the band members are arranged in a circle. And then I might go, any B, any B, why don't, we, why don't we all kind of move around the circle at some point? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, something, just an idea. Um, and yeah, so we, we get along very well. Doing that, and she'll do the same kind of things if I come with an idea. Okay. How has the set list evolved from when you were touring concert halls behind the album and now taking it to Broadway? Um, I sensed uh, when we were touring this as a con this, this as a concert that that there was a little bit of a narrative arc to it, not in the conventional sense, but there was some sort of development. Um, other people sense that too. Uh, I talked to a director that I've worked with a number of times, Alex Timbers, and he's been helping out. And the idea is, how can we bring that out a little bit more without kind of making it too obvious? Um, so, so we've kind of added some songs in the beginning to kind of allow things to settle in and be established a little bit more. We've added some stuff at the ending to kind of make that 
sense of closure a little bit clearer. And I've added some other little, there's little, little places where I talk. I don't talk a lot, but there's a few little places. So I've added a couple more of those um, where I think the things I say can help kind of show this character. And kind of maybe it's me representing uh, kind of every man. Uh, the development over the course of the show. And it's uh, the story takes place in modern times to the extent that it is a story, right? Yes, yes. It's, it's modernity. Yeah, yeah. What about the set list? How has that evolved? What, what songs are people going to hear if they come to the show? Um, they hear some old, some Talking Heads songs that they'll know. They'll hear some that they don't know. They'll hear at least one by... Uh, another artist that they might also not be familiar with. Um, so it's a mixture. Um, I dis it's, a, it's always a, a balancing act. Um, as many artists have done, I've in, indulged myself in the, in the past and gone out and said, I'm only going to do new things. Yeah. When you go to see... Uh, Whatever, when you go to see a movie, you don't want to hear them doing lines from the movie they did before. <laughs> so why do we have to do that? Anyway, <laughs> and I realized that that is kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, <laughs> people, and, I, and it's not like I don't like the things I've written in the past and they're fun to perform. So I realized if I can weave those in and make them a part and parcel of what I'm doing, then it works fine. Um, and. I discovered that because this show is so theatrical, um, because there's a lot of the impact is visual and visceral, that people will take it in, in a, as they would a, a, a piece of theater. Um, so sometimes it doesn't matter that much whether they know the song or not. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, when we do songs they know, they get Fairly, they get a reaction. But I've noticed that they don't, it's not like, oh, they're doing you know, one that I've never heard of. I'm going to go to the back and get a beer. That happens a little bit, but surprisingly, <laughs> not very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, the oldest song in the set list, I imagine the, the set list I've seen is provisional and subject to change. But the, the oldest song in the set list is E Zimbra. Oh, yeah, probably is, yes. From uh, third, out, third Talking Heads album, Fear of Music. And that's not even written or sung in the English language. Mm -hmm. So what I wonder is now, how, when, when you started thinking about this show and thinking about putting in older songs, those first three albums, which have, I think, at least two of your best known songs, how did you relate to that guy in the 70s who was singing those songs? Ah, that guy. Um, <laughs> it's, um, again, it's a balancing act. We're doing kind of some of the older material, I become that person that I was 20 or 30 years ago. It, that's the power of art, that you kind of, you, bec you suddenly get transformed and uh, become that thing that you were, or that you were involved with many, many years ago. And you kind of relive it, relive it at that moment. And yeah, it's, it becomes fun. And I, why did why decide to do that one? Um, it might have been as much a, a musical decision as a, as a lyrical one, that particular song. What do you mean by a musical decision? Uh, it might have been, I thought, oh, here's, if we're kind of, adding the various elements that will establish a show and showing what we can do as far as moving around and doing that. There's, here's the point where, boom, we're all, we've all finally arrived on stage, and we're going to show you what we can do. You were born in Scotland, uh, grew up largely outside of Baltimore. What was the first Broadway musical you saw? Oh my gosh. Um, Don't say Hamilton. No. <laughs> oh wow. Um, this yeah, it's. I have seen plenty of things on property, but I think when I arrived in New York, um, 
one of the first things I saw was, I think Robert Wilson had hired a, did a show in a Broadway theater. It was called The Letter to Queen Victoria. Mm. And it's, if you know his work, it's visually striking and uh, verbally and narratively pretty um, inscrutable. But I liked that. <laughs> Somehow that spoke to me and said, yeah, that's the way I feel about the world too. And so, yes, I saw that and uh, was kind of blown away. And then, of course, I, I saw other things. I'd, I'd go to shows at Lincoln Center or Broadway. And I've, um, I th did... I think Broadway's changing a little bit. How so? Um, not all at once. I mean, there's, there's, and there's been, recently been a number of kind of concert shows on Broadway. Um, there has been quite a number of kind of jukebox yeah. musicals about, uh, let me see, Memphis or The Temptations or Cher, or Carol King. Carol King, we can go on and on and on. And this is um, not, it's, they might be pointing towards a certain generation, but it's musically, it's not music that is like traditional MT, music theater songs. These are songs that uh, are kind of pop songs, which music theater songs used to be, the pop song, they kind of amalgamate the Cole Porter or whatever songs of the day that were popular and make us kind of story out of it. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of getting back to that with a lot of, um, but with, with using more, slightly more contemporary music. And I think that's going to continue. I think there's, I, I can't name them, but I can imagine that there's lots of contemporary popular musicians who could easily do something where their music could be used to tell a story. Well, Paul Simon did Cape Man, which I'm going to guess that you saw. I did see it. Um, I thought it was, I really liked it. I thought the music was really, really good. Um, it was not exactly kind of, let's say, pandering to a Broadway audience. Mm. I thought if he'd done that at BAM, that it cut him a little more slack and he might have, Seriously, and he might, he might have, uh, the critics might have been a little more gentle with him. Because the expectation is different at BAM? Yes, on... you're allowed to kind of uh, play around a little bit more and try something out. At that time, it was, you know, Broadway was kind of like sink or swim. Yeah. You mentioned moving to New York, and I, I think this is important also for context. In the mid-70s, if you were an artist living in New York, you were almost certainly a multimedia artist. If you were an actor, you were in a band. If you were in a band, you were acting in one of Amos Poe's movies. There was a real fluidity between the art forms that I think you like and have embraced for much of your career. Does, yeah. that, does that come out of that particular scene? It came out of that scene when uh, it seemed like there was no kind of boundaries and you could, you could kind of, you could be involved in anything. There was lots of artists who were deciding like, um, hey, I, I know I was, came out of art school, but let's make a band. That yeah. looks like it's going to be exciting. Um, or let's make, let's start making movies and that kind of thing. And it's, there's uh, always been a kind of slice of, kind of the artistic community that feels that way. Sometimes more, more rather than less. But um, yeah, I grew up seeing, say, the, the pop groups in the late 60s and early 70s. Some of them would do things like that. Mm -hmm. um, like who, do you remember? Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I mean, something as common as the Beatles, I knew that they were they weren't. Uh, they would make. They made a movie themselves that didn't do well, but 
they did, they did that. They had interests in all different kinds of music, whether it was electronic or Indian music or this or that. And I thought, and that's all kind of cool. And that other groups were very similar. There was kind of a, it was acceptable to have a wide range of interests. Mm -hmm. When did that start to die out? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, it certainly didn't for me, but yeah. I, I know there was a point where it was like, stick to what you're good at, stick to your day job. The, uh, your songwriting used to begin very often with concepts. Songs usually come out of a melody or an emotion that someone's trying to express. A lot of your early songs were concepts. I think the concept of Psycho Killer was, what if I wrote an Alice Cooper song? What would that sound like? Mm -hmm. Uh, the concept for the big country was if I were a snooty elitist New Yorker who was flying over the country, what demeaning things would I say about the people who live below me? <laughs> and and, and no, it was a concept. That's not really you, although I would argue that you couldn't have sung it with the gusto you did if there weren't some component of that in you. Oh, yes. Yeah, that you, yeah. you, you picked a, a hard one, but, but it's true. I'm not here to pick if the you, easy ones, David. If, it's, if you get, if, if, the, if the writing is successful or you know, the work is successful, then, part, then, you, then, then it's easy for you to kind of identify with it. Um, immerse yourself in it and be, embody yourself in the character that you've written yeah. and go, yes, I can, see, it's not me, but I can, I can see that point of view. Rock and roll is acting. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, then we'll get back to, sometimes it's acting authentic. Oh. But we shouldn't go too far here. <laughs> <laughs> who was it who said, sincerity is the most important thing in life, and once you can fake that, you've got it made? I don't know. Who said that? I don't know who said that. Anyone in the audience know who said that? Hollywood agent joke. Hollywood agent joke, yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do uh, when this run ends? It's, it opens August 4th. It's set to run for about 15 weeks. What, what's, you're always looking to the future. What, what's your future? Um, I've been working on a, besides some other things, I've been working on a, a kind of immersive theatrical science <laughs> piece that, is, that I've done in little pieces. I did a, little, a miniature version of some of us as a test out in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley, um, sort of correctly assuming that they're going to like this. And <laughs> Um, we made some mistakes in, in the way we presented it there, but um, I didn't give up, so it's kind of evolved. And, and so I, th uh, I think my attention will kind of shift towards that being realized so, so at some point next year. There was um, <laughs> the, the version we did in Silicon Valley. We ha it's actors to take you through these different rooms. Um, and we, we, had, we had the actors dressed in lab coats and uh, telling that they were representing some place called the Institute. And they gave a little bit of history and they talked about the founder and there was pictures of people on the walls and all this kind of thing. And well, they have some smarty pants people out there at Stanford University yeah. Yeah. and they weren't having any of it. <laughs> <laughs> they started quizzing these poor actors about, well, if you, you wait a minute, if you're talking about this, you must know the work of so and so. And the poor actors were kind of just completely befuddled. We realized, oh, oh God, we can't do that. <laughs> so the audience found it inauthentic. Uh, <laughs> yes. It was kind of like you look like a, a doctor, so. But why don't you know everything? <laughs> I'm having a heart attack. Can you help me? Yes. That would be real commitment. But you're wearing the right clothes. <laughs> you mentioned Robert Wilson. 
um, <laughs> with whom you did uh, a theater piece called The Knee Plays. And there's a song in The Knee Plays, thank you, that's called In the Future. You wrote this around about 1985. These were not prognostications. In, there were different levels of sincerity and tongue-in-cheekness in the lyrics. Some but, of them contradict one another. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want, keeping in mind that you wrote this in 1985, I want to revisit a couple of the things you predicted. And did they come true, or are they almost true? Oh, um, in the future, and I'm going to try not to do this in your voice, although it's really tempting for me to do that. <laughs> in the future, it will be next to impossible to tell girls from boys even in bed. True now? True now. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the future, water will be expensive. I, Whoa, you, that's coming. You nailed that. Uh, were there any of these that, that you meant more sincerely than others? Um, probably, probably. I don't, don't have them all in my head right now, but there was probably some of them where I thought, that's, yeah, where I felt like I'm putting myself out there. I really think this is an important thing to say, but some of them are just seem kind of ridiculous. But yeah, it was all about that. It was all about that voice of like, uh, in a world where that kind of thing was, was like that a, kind of attitude. A futuristic, yeah, yeah. you were mocking futurism a little bit. A little bit, yes. In the future, political and other decisions will be based completely on opinion polls. <laughs> I think we went right past that already. <laughs> I, I think almost opinion polls don't matter anymore. In the future, the helpless will be killed. Mm. Well, that comes up occasionally. Thankfully, I think we've We've never s stuck by that. Yeah. Uh, and then the, uh, the last one that I'll mention. In the future, there will be so much going on that no one will be able to keep track of it. Well, that's already here. That's here, isn't it? <laughs> what, what's your morning routine in terms of information? And I promise I'm not looking for a plug for the New York Times. When, when, when you get up in the morning, how do you begin to connect to the world? Um, I read, yeah, I read a number of newspapers and magazines and um, on, a ta on a tablet, often in bed, and then I'll kind of gradually migrate to the kitchen. Um, I'll be checking emails that might have come in at the same time. It's a process. It can, t it can take a while, too. Um, I don't... I read some, but I, I kind of stick to uh, whatever. The Times, The Guardian, The New Yorker, Financial Times, Economist. I mean, sometimes there's a few feeds and blog posts and this and that. Uh, there's more than that. New York Review of Books. There's a, there's a bunch that I will check. Um, there's more than that. But yeah, it's a. I'm a news junkie, a little bit. Yeah. You also travel a lot. And I'm curious your opinion about cities. In some ways, cities are becoming much more homogenous around the world. Every city has a Starbucks 3.4 blocks, and McDonald's, and chain stores, and retail shops. Do you think that cities are becoming more alike, or is that just a superficial aspect of city life? Hard to tell. I, I'm sorry. I can't give a you know, clean answer. When, when I go to some place, of course, uh, my friends and I, or my friends who live in that town, their kind of their radar is out for the stuff that is unique to that town. Mm -hmm. um, whatever, the kind of food that they make, or the music that's there, or other odd museums, or whatever it might be. Yeah. So it's kind of like I s seek out the things that are not 
kind of cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. So they're there, they're still there. If you had to live somewhere other than New York City, where would you live? <laughs> some, some days when I get up and read all those newspapers, I go, oh, I think it's time to go off the grid and live in a little cabin somewhere. Sounds like the Unabomber or something. Um, <laughs> but, some, yes, but you know, we probably all feel that way from time to time. I've never done it, but you know, every once in a while it passes through your mind, oh, maybe I just need to walk away from all this, but I don't. Could you sew your own clothes and raise your own food? Um, clothes? I, I, yeah, I've made clothes before. You have? Not, not very well, <laughs> but, I, but I have done it. Uh, and food is tougher. Food, is, food yeah. is tough. Yeah, I would be lost without takeout. <laughs> um, when did you make clothes? Um, probably early, mid-70s. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to look cool, and I couldn't afford it, so I made some things that I, I started with some really difficult stuff. I wanted to uh, have kind of more of a rock and roll look at that point, so I made myself a pair of leather trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Things I found out. Yeah. Uh, of course, you need a special sewing machine needle <laughs> for leather. It doesn't. You can't just use a regular needle; they'll break. Um, so, but you can get that. Um, the, other, <laughs> the other thing is um, leather stretches, which is nice for, nice for our shoes. Um, right. <laughs> but. It means that if you make leather powder, you get this big kind of <laughs> poochy thing here. Um, <laughs> they end up looking quite misshapen. Were you wearing them all day long? No, I also realized you're not supposed to wash them. So I oh, thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> you put your, your handmade no, black leather I didn't. pants I, in I, the I wash. I realized you can't. So I thought, what am I going to do? I, it, I can't, this, these things are going to get stinky. <laughs> so they got retired. It was, it was a thing. We're going to do uh, audience questions in a couple of minutes. And uh, I think the protocol is that there is a mic stand over there and a mic stand over there. And if you uh, want to ask David a question, just please make sure that your question is a question. <laughs> Questions end with question marks. If your question begins, I have more of a statement than a question, that's not a question. <laughs> so you can start lining up now if you, uh, if you want to ask some questions. Something that I think is integral to your music that people don't really talk about a lot is your guitar playing. Rhythm guitar playing, it, you, your guitar tone, your style of playing is unique. When you are playing on a song live, it sounds different than when you're not playing on a song. Mm. Where did your guitar style come from? Um, well, obviously, I, my, listening, my listening taste. I was listening to R&B and kind of uh, fringe kind of rock stuff at the same time. And they just sort of, I thought, oh, I can find a common ground between some of these things. Yeah. And it's more of a percussive sound and style, would you say? Yes. Most of the time, it's more percussive, yeah. Uh, OK, gentlemen over here First, okay. with the crossed arms. Oh, uh, hi. Yeah. I'm Eli. Um, so you've worked with a plethora of different musicians, all of different styles, backgrounds, etc. And I've wondered if there was any consistent piece or pieces of advice that you've given them as musicians. That dream. I've given them? Yes. Or they've given you. Um, oh my goodness. Um, no, but most of the time I'm most of the time I'm listening and kind of reacting and things like that. Um, if there's any advice, it might be just show up. 
Fair enough. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> right, thank yeah. you. It's hard to top that. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen with the glasses. You've done a lot of things, and I'm wondering which of the projects you've done you're proudest of or fondest of, and why Imelda Marcos as the subject of a musical? That's two questions. Uh, he's, 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 I'll permit okay. it. Okay. Um, of course, I think probably not unlike other people, I tend to be uh, give kind of a, a little bit of extra love to the orphans, to the ones who aren't so well appreciated. Um, I did a documentary in, in, uh, in Brazil about Candomblé, which is a, an Afro-Brazilian religion, uh, and I did it in the state of Bahia. And uh, I was very proud of it. The experience of doing it changed the way I thought about a lot of things. So it was also a, pers a moment of kind of personal transition but I also felt that some of that went into the work. Um, so that, you know, that's the kind of thing where you, you know, you're proud of something, but not too many people know about it, and maybe that's the way it will stay. Well, I am Elda Marcos. Uh, she was, given my age and that I knew that she went to Studio 54 and all this kind of thing, um, and I knew kind of the whole glamorous world that she came out of and the embezzlement and everything else that was going on. Um, when, it, when I was reminded at one point of how much she loved going to clubs, that she installed a mirror ball in her New York townhouse, um, I went online and I found a video of her dancing under that mirror ball with Khashoggi, the arms dealer. And I thought, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. <laughs> and so I thought, uh, the, the musical world that, that she surrounds herself in, it's there. It's this club music. Can that be used to tell the story? Let's see. That was the idea. The, the question that, that came first actually made me think of a question. Because the, the question was sort of about you being a mentor to other people. Did you have a musical mentor? Um, oh. You mean someone that I worked with? Yeah. Um, Helped you figure out things like how to sew leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, lots of times. Um, there's um, Talking Heads and I have worked often with Brian Eno, who has often pushed the band or I to kind of try new things. It's not mentorship in the normal way of um, here's how you do things. It's more like, what if you did this? Um, there's, there are plenty of other musicians out there. Um, from different parts of the world, including the United States, uh, who I l hear their work and I go, that's, that's amazing, and how can, I, how can I learn to do anything approaching that when they do? And I, I, yeah. This gentleman here. Hi, David Byrne. That's kind of weird to say out loud, but okay. Um, <laughs> So my question actually pertained to the immediacy of like art and culture in the information age, specifically as it relates to rock music. Like, for instance, when you were making like Remain in Light, the music of Fela Kuti, for instance, would be a lot harder for someone your age at the time to come by than somebody now, for instance, making rock music. And you would think that that would make the, like a lot of bands really want to be diverse and experimental, which obviously there are an abundance of, but I feel like the trend tends to move towards homogenization rather than sort of using those disparate groups to be individualistic. Is that something that you could maybe see potential in going forward, or is that something you agree with at all? Yeah, there, there are. It does seem sometimes that when everything is available, it makes it very, very hard to make a decision. Um, 
It makes it very hard to stay focused when there's all this stuff going on to distract you, whether it's music, all the you know, infinite playlists right. that are available. And you just go, whoa, I don't know where to begin. How do I, you know? Um, so yeah, it becomes like, we, well, I think that's why the, the playlists are so popular. Mm -hmm. They make the choice for you. Um, and some of them apparently, I, I don't know, but apparently some of them uh, get very close after looking at what, you've, what you like. They, the algorithms actually become your friend. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, I'm not sure I go along with that, but yeah. Um, but so yes, having a filter so that you're not completely kind of just dumbstruck by the infinite choice is, is kind of crucial. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. If you guys are on Spotify, you should definitely follow David. Uh, he makes fantastic playlists, one of which was I think this is the most notorious of your playlists. It was called Music from Shithole Countries. <laughs> <laughs> and, and clearly in this case, it was facetious. <laughs> so what, how did that playlist come about? I mean, I think I have some idea. Yeah, you have I'm, an idea, yeah. <laughs> and it had to be, you know, give a musical response to that. Yeah. So, yeah. Here's the, yeah, it's kind of like, here's the answer. Right. Why do shithole countries make better music than the United States of <laughs> yeah. America if they're shithole countries? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so your Instagram is one of my favorite uh, on my feed, and I think it's like very interesting and captures your travels quite well. Um, I'm curious how you <laughs> use social media as a tool to amplify your voice. Um, and then two-part question. Um, I saw you at a Pioneer Works event in the audience, and you were very into Regina Spector. Um, but I'm wondering what artists like would be on your Spotify fresh finds. Like, who are you looking out for? Oh my goodness! Oh, that's when my mind goes blank. Um, thank, I'm glad you like the. I just post my my own pictures on Instagram with maybe a caption, and that's it. Um, uh, I'm not very active on social media, though. It's, I mean, but it is used as a, I mean, we use it for, in the, the theater people use it and things like that for marketing and all that, and it apparently works quite well, but I just use that one for putting my own pictures on. Um, oh my God, artists, uh, let's, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's some, I don't want to leave some out because there's, there's so many that I listen to. I think if people want to know what you're listening to, they can go hear your playlists. That's true. I try to do it by category, but sometimes there's just this, an eclectic list. And you also have a uh, streaming radio service on yeah, that's your kind website. Of, that's right? kind of an overlap. Yeah. Where, where do people go if they want to hear that? Um, I think it's davidburn.com. Yep. Yes, sir. Hi. I had a question about collaboration. You've had a lot of great collaborations over the years. Do you find collaborations frustrating, thrilling, exciting, everything in between? Oh, uh, obviously I've done a lot of them, and I, that must mean I like them. Um, <laughs> they, I, f I find them kind of stimulating. They give me a kick in the butt to, tr to try and force me to try and do something else, to try get inside somebody else's head and kind of figure out, okay, what are they thinking and how, um, um, how do they work? Can I adapt myself and work that way? And is, is that, is that going to be something that works for me? Uh, when it really works, and it doesn't always, you kind of get a one plus one equals three, you get something new out of it. Um, when it doesn't, uh, well, it's, sometimes then not that big of a deal that it didn't work. Um, the, <laughs> the, the funniest one, I think, was I worked with a, a uh, European techno guy. Um, and I wrote kind of words and a melody to a track that he'd done. And I sent it, ba sent it back, and he told me, 
played his track at the wrong speed. <laughs> it was a technical glitch, but I wrote the whole thing with, at the track at the wrong speed. And, and, and because techno is, is really, the, the tempos are really important. You know, it's like if you're at 125 or 130 or whatever, it's, it has to be that. So that was kind of it. <laughs> but you're, you're leaving us hanging. What happened after that? Uh, I, I redid it, but to me it wasn't quite the same, but it, I redid it. <laughs> he should have released it at the wrong speed. For him, no. That, for him, that was just like, no, you, you don't do that. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, following up on the uh, shithole countries, uh, do you think there are some artists today that are doing a lot to move the cultural conversation that maybe more of us should know about or that you think are making a difference? Oh, uh, yes. The answer is yes, but I don't, but I don't know the names. I would have to, again, sorry, go get my phone out and start looking through the, the playlist. We'll wait. Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll look for the sh we'll look for the uh, new playlist of those. For okay. You. Okay. <laughs> Sir. Yeah. Hi, Rob. Hi, David. Uh, this has been really great. I've enjoyed it. Um, my name's Andy, and uh, I go to a lot of live music, as I'm sure you do, also, David. One of my favorite bands, um, not to be totally stereotypical, but my, one of my favorite bands is the band Fish, who often cover Talking Head songs. Um, one could say that uh, to your tempo point, they've gotten to a point where they play cities so prolifically that they've kind of made it their own in some regards. Um, have you seen Fish? Are you a fan? How do you feel about people covering your music and sort of taking it to different areas? Oh, it's exciting when people cover, thinking they turn it into their own song. I have uh, not seen them. I've seen Trey perform, but I've not seen them. And, but I've heard a lot of these recordings. I mean, they did somewhere, they did like a whole album. Yeah, they covered Remain in Light yeah. In, yeah. in 1998, yeah, in its entirety. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're into that sort of thing, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, I don't know. I, I, Andy, unfortunately, I think that's as close as you're going to ever get to hearing Remain in Light played in full by yeah. the original band. <laughs> is, there, is there anyone that you would be interested in covering? That I, whose songs I would cover? Do, yeah. do you, do you want to keep it a surprise what the cover is in, uh, in your Broadway show, or do you want to talk about that? Uh, we'll leave it for the show. Okay. It's, 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 uh... David covers in his show a great song by a current artist who I can't name, <laughs> uh, but who is fantastically talented. You also, one of my, one of my favorite uh, covers of yours is I Want to Dance with Somebody by Whitney Houston. Yeah, I, did, I covered that one time. Um, it's, everybody knows that. They'd love to sing along to it. It's a great song. Um, I did some other stuff, too. Uh, oh, years ago, Gypsy Woman. Anybody know that song? Uh, Crystal uh, Waters. Da, 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 uh -huh. da, da, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a, it's a disco song that was making a social statement. Yeah, it was uh, She's Homeless Yeah, yeah. in the song. Yes, sir. So you were uh, talking a little bit earlier about artifice and what's kind of genuine or artificial and the fact that you've never been fooled by a, a kitchen set on stage. And I would imagine there are some people, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, they get the point. Uh, but I imagine there's some people in the world that are fooled by that. And I think about kind of how they react to some of these uh, these shows and kind of what, you know, them losing themselves in that world. And I was wondering if there is ever either a piece that you created or maybe have seen that maybe you wish you were fooled by, that you wish that you could, um, it, like, bring to existence. There's um, was lots of movies. Um, lots of movies where you, you know it's all sets and everything else where... You want, you want to be immersed in that world. They've created a completely, a whole world for you. And I don't just mean like CG effects and stuff, but other kinds of things. Um, <laughs> uh, 
whatever I watch. I've, last night I started watching Lost Horizon, which is uh, this movie where uh, a plane, a load of people, finds its way into basically utopia, uh, a little hidden valley in the Himalayas, and, and uh, it gradually gets explained to them what, yes, what makes it utopia, how it works. Not every little detail, but you're kind of going, what? Can I live there? Do I, would I want to live there and never, never leave and get, never get out? So this is, yeah, there's all these dilemmas. Did you watch the whole movie? It's long. I, I'll finish it later. Are we keeping you from it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sir. Hi. The music industry is changing a lot over the years, especially recently. Uh, it's almost about beyond the music in some regard. When you're looking at collaborations, have you thought about collaborations? Obviously, you're collaborating with Broadway. Are there collaborations that you'd want to see happen beyond just uh, the music or utilizing you as an artist and a musician to help collaborate or launch other properties, brands, products, et cetera? Do you fantasize about that? Um. Wow, I'm not even sure exactly what, what, what you mean. That there, there, uh, I'm, not sh I'm not sure. Can you be kind of give a specific example, maybe? Yeah, like uh, if there was a, a headphone set or a uh, art piece or a, a, a movie script or, or something that would be beyond, even if it was a product launch, something that would utilize or like epitomize who you are, but would be a collaboration that would be beyond just something you've done as a musician, but would, would, would recognize you as a musician? Oh, I, well, I could see maybe things that are um, whatever, you know, that have some so, kind of so, social, do some, in, whatever it is, engage in some kind of social good or social justice or something like that, and where it's a thing that, whatever it might be that does that, and I could go, yes, um, I'll endorse that. But <laughs> yes, um, yeah, right now it's kind of hard to imagine. Hmm. Yes, sir. David, having been a fan of yours for many years, I go back to the 70s with you. Uh, I'm gonna ask this question for the Talking Heads fans in the audience. Is there any chance of pulling out some of that wonderful old music you did back then and releasing some of that live music that you did back in the 70s and 80s? And my second part of that question is, what's the chance of a Talking Heads reunion? <laughs> Yeah, it's not the reunion is yeah very very unlikely. The, um, if if there's old recordings, um, yes, they'll, I'm sure once the rights are sorted out, they they'll come out uh, whenever they can. There's, I have no reason to withhold them, even though some of them I think sound a little dicey. But um, but yeah, there's things like that. But it's. Uh, some of them are okay, but some of them are, there's not always a lot of new. I just wonder how much new information is in there. Um, well, we'll see. Which tours do you have multi-track recordings of? Do you know offhand? Um, mostly the more recent ones, okay. because back in the day it was really expensive yeah. to record a live show. So you would the recordings would tend to be like just a stereo mix of, and that was it. That's all you could do with it, because um, that's what you could afford. Yes. Hi, David. I was at your show um, a few months ago, and I felt something that I've never felt at a live show. I've been to quite a few. Um, I was wondering if you could at all articulate what you're feeling when you're on stage, uh, maybe um, in respect to American Utopia. If I, so can you say the end part again? Sure. The, the last part or the first part? The, f the end part. <laughs> the what part? 
The end, the end, sorry, the, the end, end part. part. Yes, um, I was just at your show. I was so happy. I couldn't knock the smile off of my face. I'm wondering um, how you feel on stage in respect to maybe specifically American Utopia. How, how do I go on stage? How do you feel when you're How do I feel when I go on stage? Yes. Um, to, <laughs> to, to be really honest, if there's like a, seems like a full house there, uh, and you can hear kind of the murmur of people from, come from the wings of the stage, it's pretty exciting. Um, if it was kind of half empty, it would be kind of less exciting. <laughs> 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 Especially for your manager and your agent. Yes, for them too. <laughs> but it, yes, it's, it is very exciting. It's like, oh, look, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? Are they, how, are they, how, how is this group going to like it? That makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, how did you go about your selection of musicians for Utopia, number one? Number two, how are you going to move drummers forward without taking breaks? Is it going to be on a sliding track or something? OK, the musicians, uh, some of them were uh, people I'd worked with before, whether in, uh, in the theater or in performance. Um, the, the drummers, I talked to my friend Mauro that I'd worked with many times before, and I said, OK, you know what's needed here. Um, I want you to kind of put together the players that you think can do this, that'll be up for this. And so he, he kind of did that. Um, yeah, and sometimes I would. Sometimes there was a little, let's say, affirmative action where I'd say, "I think we need, uh, I think we need another woman in here," mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, and so, yeah. What was the the other part of the question? How are you going to, without taking breaks, move people? Like, oh, without like taking a breaks on the on the stage? Yeah, like a drummer forward. Like it's hard to get the drum sets. Right, move? Yeah, yeah. Uh, move. How do I do? I, imagine a small town July 4th parade, right? And there are four kids playing trumpet, and there's one guy, and he's just got a bass drum strapped to his chest. It's a little bit like that. Different aspects of the traditional drum kit get assigned to a percussionist who walks mm -hmm. around playing it, and it's attached to his body. Yeah, he's wearing a harness just like uh, the, the guys at football games wear. So it's not like a Carl Palmer setup or anything like that. No, no, no. It's, no, no. They're <laughs> okay. wearing them all. No Carl Palmer. No, no one's begging the gong with their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, we have time only for a couple more. Yes. So you mentioned testing a piece in Silicon Valley. I was wondering how tech has impacted your creative practice and how you may have incorporated it in your practice. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly impacted the music business, but, uh, but as far as Writing, uh, yes, now it's possible to write using laptops and exchange things with other musicians via emails and uh, various kind of transfer protocols and things like that. So that has been pretty easy to do. You can manipulate sounds using kind of stuff on your laptops and computers and things like that. So that's all pretty good, but the basic for me, sometimes the basic writing process, um, it still comes down to kind of the words and a melody. And maybe I use a guitar just to sketch it out and then bring, then bring the machines in. Uh, sometimes, to me, it's important that not to bring the machines in too early, because then they'll start, you'll start to do what they want. Um, they, they'll subtly you'll start doing things that are easier to do with a certain kind of software or uh, certain kinds of gadgets. Um, and it might not be the best thing for that song. But if, if you've kind of already got an idea of what it wants to be, then you can go, OK, no, no, that's, the, the software is going to have to do what I say. Cool. Thank you. 
Yes. Um, so I was wondering if you ever thought a little bit about saying something very different to very different type of audience, because I know that a lot of what you say is sort of preaching to the choir, and we're all big fans, and we've been following you for years and years and years, and do you ever think about changing sort of your audience? And I know how difficult that would be, but like inner city youth, and you know, I work a lot with inner city youth, and I know that they, you know, people forget about them, so to speak, and they would never be here. They would never, they don't know who David Byrne is, and they're not gonna know because you do, you, you cater to our tastes and our, and we continue to love you, which is awesome. <laughs> Please don't change, <laughs> but. The, well, a um, couple of things. Uh, I've been working on a, on a project that, that involves high school kids, um, kind of interpreting different songs, and then just kind of letting them do it in, in their own way. It's not done yet, but it's getting close. Um, and so that kind of lets them reinterpret it, which gives it a completely different meaning. And they're an audience that, to some extent, they don't know who I am. Um, it's completely new to them. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that being on Broadway that at some point, maybe you'll get to a point where the fans have come and gone, and at some point, maybe word will get out, like, hey, there's this interesting show that you should see. I've never heard of this guy, um, <laughs> but I, I hear it's a really interesting show. I hope I can get to that point where then the people that come are like uh, sort of a regular Broadway crowd that just comes because they hear it's a good show and not because they're necessarily fans of mine. They're online at TKTS, and there are tickets, and they walk in, <laughs> no idea what they're in for. Right, right, that's the exciting yeah. part. Uh, uh, you get to ask the last and best question. Well, I... No pressure. <laughs> I want to ask about your uh, record company, because I will use a very particular example, but I hope it works for more than that. I'm from Brazil. And when you launched Yon Lu, nobody had ever heard of him. And after that, he was on Rolling Stone. Now there's a movie. How, how do you go about finding these things in these distant countries that nobody there heard about? And how do you feel um, that, like for this one boy who died, and now he's, he has a movie, he was on Rolling Stone. How do you feel about that? The, uh, who's the boy who died? What? Yon Lu. Oh, okay. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, years ago, I, I realized that uh, I was making compilations of music that I really liked and giving them to, giving them to friends. And I realized that, uh, well, also, that this was a lot of work and that maybe other people would like them too. So I started putting, uh, putting out music. There were collections of Brazilian music, um, working with different artists and sometimes, sometimes, and yeah, actually getting them to make new music. Uh, and then we went to, did some stuff with Cuba. Uh, there was kind of a workaround about the, the, bo the boycott. There was a way to work around it and, and put out some of that things. And then uh, musicians in, the United States and uh, some in an imaginary continent that I called Afropia, which is kind of, uh, well, you can imagine. Um, anyway, how, how did this happen? Yes, so, so um, some of these things sold quite well and some of them not so well, and, and sometimes, sometimes I was criticized by Brazilians, for, and they say, why would you put this out? Look, we have all these in incredible artists in our country. Why are you putting out this weird stuff? But I mean, how did you find that weird stuff that nobody heard about in Brazil? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's just an accident, and sometimes, you won't be surprised, people hand it to me. Yeah, I, I imagine. <laughs> Uh, people hand you music pretty often. 
Yeah, and sometimes it's really good. Yeah. What, what's, do you remember the best thing anyone ever handed you? Oh, no. No, but, but sometimes, yes. Sometimes it's really, uh, especially if it's somebody you kind of trust, and then they give it to you and you go. And then how do you feel when this weird thing that nobody heard about becomes a movie? <laughs> it's, uh, it's great. Yes, of course, it's great. Rock stars have influence, and you can use your influence just to promote your own career, or you can use it to bring attention to, other, for instance, an opening act. That's mm -hmm. what opening acts are for. Uh, let's, let's finish by talking a little bit more about American Utopia. Uh, the, the songs are miniatures and snapshots. Some of them are happy. Some of them are unpleasant. Uh, Bullet, I find particularly difficult to listen to these days. Um, but one theme that runs through all the different aspects of the songs is money. At what point did you realize that that was turning into a theme? I, I sort of didn't know until you just mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that would be so August 5th. <laughs> OK. So at 8.17 uh, PM. That's, uh, well, I'm, I'm surprised if I've managed to do that, um, to make that uh, insinuate economics or something into kind of, uh, into songwriting. Yeah. What is it about money that is relevant to an American utopia? Um, well, obviously, yeah, economics and finance and everything, it affects all of us, it affects our lives. and those of our children and how, how, how we, how much hope we have for our children or for our f own futures and all that. Mm -hmm. David, thank you for doing your first Times Talk. I thank hope you. it won't be the last. Yeah. And thank you, thank all of you <laughs> for coming out. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, David. <laughs>